For those of you that may not know me, my name is Chris Silver. My wife and I have been coming here almost since the beginning. I think we started about six months after the church plant did. Uh, one of the things that I do here, I teach the starting point class, and my wife and I also teach children's church, and we really enjoy doing that as well. Uh, I started off, I want to start off today, I was thinking about 2020. <laughs> We've done a lot of thinking about 2020, right? And I made a list of things that I did not expect in 2020. The list was rather long, and I, I actually thought of one just now, and, and in honor of, of Pastor Dave, I will, will share this one. This isn't on the list I planned, but is there anything more 2020 than Iowa State leading the Big 12 at the midpoint of the year, right? <laughs> I'm a Hawk fan for those of you that don't know me. But I was just thinking about this morning, man, there's nothing more than 2020 than that. But no, it's good, it's, it, it's good. But the, the list that I wrote down, a list of things I never expected in 2020, some of them kind of silly, some of them a little bit more serious. But number one on my list of things that I was shocked in 2020 is that the NCAA championships were canceled. I mean, I thought they would have those no matter what was going on, especially the basketball one. I mean, that thing's like a billion dollar money maker. I did not expect that to get canceled. I also did not expect the wrestling one to get canceled because the Hawks were gonna win it. The last year was their year. Hopefully this year will be again, but, but I didn't expect that. Another thing I did not expect is I did not expect high school sports to be canceled last spring. I, I deal a lot in my life with middle school and high school athletics. I did not expect that. You know, I thought initially, okay, we, we roll in after spring break and we're gonna take a couple of weeks off and you think, all right, we'll be back at it first April. Track, soccer, all those kinds of things, they'll get going. And it's the middle of April and it's the end of April. <laughs> And nothing gets going. And I, I, I thought a lot about, you know, the seniors, parents of seniors, you know, and when, when you work through those things, when you're an athlete, when you're a fine arts, you know, you, when you have your concerts and all that kind of thing, those things are special. They matter, right? And, and when you're a parent, when you're a, a participant, whether it's an academic contest, a band, choir, whatever else, athletics, you know, those things matter. And when you're rolling through those things and, and you don't get the lasts that you thought you were going to get, whether it's your first last with your oldest or your last lasts with your youngest, those things are not easy. And my heart went out to kids in multiple communities that I know that did not get to experience their first or their last lasts. And so I didn't expect that. Another one, this one's more silly. <clears throat> well, I mean, there are consequences to it, I suppose, but real life consequences. But the movie theaters being shut down. I'm a big movie going guy. I love to go watch the big new blockbusters in the theater. I like to get the big bucket of buttered popcorn and sit down and enjoy the movie in the theater. I've always loved that. And movie theaters getting canceled and all the big releases running to 2021. I didn't expect that. I did not expect also to have to teach on Zoom for two and a half months to end the year. Uh, if you don't know my day job, I teach at Des Moines Christian. I teach freshman and sophomore Bible there. And we went online actually right after spring break. And if you've never done that, I'm not sure how to explain to you how much of a drain that is. And for those of you in the business world that have been Zoom, doing Zoom meetings now for months and months and months, you get it. It's draining. You don't think it is, but it is. I mean, I, I was more tired after a day full of teaching classes online than just if I'd gone to school. And I watch my kids roll up, you know, after a day of online learning. They're whooped puppies. It's funny. It just, it takes more out of you than, than you think it would. And so I did not expect to have Zoom meetings for two and a half months to end the 1920 school year. 
Did not expect that at all. <laughs> then the last one. Uh, I did not expect my four-year-old at the time, she's five now, she's turned five, but I did not expect my four-year-old to be able to use the word quarantine correctly in a sentence. We'd be sitting around talking about things maybe we wanted to do and, our, and, and Vesper would just say, we can't because it's the quarantine. Oh, yes, it is. Something else that I never expected in 2020 is how hard the cancellation of the end of the school year would hit me. Me just think, yeah, we're gonna keep rolling online. And you know, it's one of those things you kinda know in the back of your mind could hit, but you didn't really expect it or want it to hit. And I remember sitting down for the governor's conference. We knew the announcement was coming. And so you sit down to watch it and she says the, the schools are gonna be closed for the rest of the year. And it, it crushed me. I mean, one of my favorite, I mean, as, as a teacher, I love walking around the classroom, talking to students, trying to get involved in their lives a little bit. I mean, that's why you do it. And when that announcement came down, it absolutely crushed me. And I, and I know my kids struggled with it as well. And one of the neat things that a lot of the high schools did around uh, the state on Friday nights once this, once this hit was they would turn on their football lights, their baseball lights, their softball lights. Just kind of, you know, in, a, in memory of kind of what was lost. And, and I, I went the first night just to kind of get a sense of, of closure. I went to mourn and that was kind of the way that, that I did it. And I'm sure people did it in different ways, but I went home that night and I couldn't sleep. You know, just there was a lot of weight, a lot of heaviness. Again, just thinking about a lot of a lot of kids that I'd known since they were kindergarten, first grade that didn't get a lot of things. And I know life goes on and it's not the end of the world, but in the moment, you know, you you mourn those things. And I I was thinking of the lament psalms and how the psalmist starts off writing with terrible circumstances but then at the end turns and puts their hope in the Lord. And you know what? It's okay to mourn. It's okay to not be okay. But what we've got to do in those moments is turn our focus back to the Lord. And it's not that you fix yourself and then go to the Lord. You don't have to do that. If you read through the Psalms, the Psalms at times is a mess. And it's turning to the Lord right in the middle of the mess. God doesn't need you pretending to be okay. God wants you when you're not. And that's, that's where we need to be, I think, with our focus on, on the Lord. And how did you handle the quarantine? How did you handle it? For some, it may have been extremely difficult. Maybe some people really liked it. I don't know. My family, we, we went on walks a lot. Um, we ate in a lot. We decided that we were gonna you know, we want, all of our eating out money was gonna go to the restaurants here in Polk City. So that's one thing we did. So once or twice a week, we'd, we'd go to Papa's Pizzeria or wherever and get some food and, and try to help out the businesses that way. Another one we did that was kind of silly, but again, I'm a big movie fan. Uh, the Palms Theater out in Waukee started selling curbside popcorn. And it's a Fridley Theater. It's an Iowa-owned company. And my first job was at a Fridley Theater as a sophomore in high school. And we're like, we're gonna go support them. So we would drive out there and do that. But how did you handle it? Again, maybe you handled it well, maybe you didn't. I think I did pretty well the first quarantine. But then we had a second one. Middle of September, smack dab in the middle of football season, our family's home for 24 days. I did not handle that one very well. I was kind of frustrated, I was angry. You know, I was pushing the woe is me button. We were probably in the middle of it, and, and my wife says to me, well, have you been praying about this? <laughs> nope, sure haven't, because I knew if I started praying about it, my heart would have to change. I knew my heart was wrong, and I wanted to wallow in my self-pity. I wanted to wallow in my anger. Don't we like to do that sometimes? And I knew if I started praying about it, I'd have to change, and I didn't want to. But I did start praying about it. 
and I started seeking the Lord in it. And one of the other things that I'm doing is I'm reading through the Bible in a year, and I know we've got a program here. I, I'm doing a slightly different one. Adam Wainwright, who's a pitcher with the St. Louis Cardinals, is doing one. And he, you follow it on Twitter, and every day he puts out the passage you're supposed to read, and then just kind of his thoughts on the passages. And it's been very challenging. And one of the passages that I found right after I had to start praying about things was Psalm 105. And Psalm 105 very much challenged me because it reminded me that God is good. It reminded me that God is faithful. It reminded me that I need to be thankful. It reminded me that I need to be grateful for who he is and what he has done and what he will do. And God used this psalm to change my heart. And, and I wanna challenge you and challenge me today that God wants you to give thanks and tell others about him. You know, I don't know how you're handling all the circumstances, all the situations. There's a million of them, right? We got COVID, we got the election, we got, we got all this stuff going on and we tend to get our eyes on that. And we tend to get our eyes off the Lord. I can assure you today, it does not matter who the president is God is still on the throne. Doesn't matter what's going on with COVID, God is still on the throne. And I'm not minimizing any of this. These things are very serious. But God's on the throne. And we need to get our eyes on him. So let's go to Psalm 105. God wants you to give thanks and tell others about him. God wants you to give thanks and tell others about him. Psalm 105. Good stuff today. God's word's always good. Okay, Psalm 105. I'm gonna actually start off at verse six. I'm gonna read verses six and seven. Then we're gonna kind of take a brief look at the rest of the chapter. Then we're going to rewind and come back to the beginning. So just to kind of let you know where I'm going. So Psalm 105, verses six and seven, and the psalmist says this, O offspring of Abraham, his servant. This would be the Israelites. So O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. And then I wanna notice verse eight, he remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. I just love that. Remember this, nation of Israel. He is the Lord. His judgments are in the, all the earth and he remembers his covenant forever. God does not forget the promises and the covenants that he makes. So I wanna briefly look at a few ways that God remembered his covenant with Israel. And you could preach sermons on all of these. We're just gonna hit the highlights but God remembered the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he made a covenant that cannot be broken. But he remembered this covenant, first of all, let's take a look at verse 12, when the Israelites were few in number. So verse 12, Psalm 105 says, when they were few in number of little account and sojourners in it. So God gave them the land of Canaan as their possession. God originally promised it to Abraham. And he remembered his covenant where there were just a few of them wandering around. Verse 14, God, or Psalmist says, God allowed no one to oppress them. God rebuked kings on their accounts. So God remembered his covenant where there were just few. So it started off with just Abraham and his family. Then finally Isaac is born and then Jacob and Jacob's 12 sons. But there's not a lot of them in comparison to the nation around them. But God remembered his covenant with them. And there was one instance where Abraham kind of slipped up, but God rebuked a king on behalf of Abraham to make sure that his promises were kept. Secondly here, God remembered the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he sent Joseph ahead of them and he brought a famine on the land. This one, oh my goodness, this, this challenges me a little bit. 
Because in verse 16, it says, when God summoned the famine on the land, God brought the famine. God broke all supply of bread. Just kind of work that through. Sometimes we, oh man, tough circumstances. Well, it was tough circumstance at that point in time. They didn't have any food. And God sent a man ahead of them, verse 17, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, his feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Anybody want to sign up for that? You think Joseph expected that? When his father told him to go find his brothers and see how things were going with the flocks? I don't think so. You think Joseph would have chosen these circumstances if he'd known ahead of time? Hey, you want to be sold into slavery? You want to get falsely accused by Mrs. Potiphar? You want to get thrown into prison? You want to be forgotten about in prison? Do you want all these things? I'm guessing not. And I think about that with all the circumstances of 2020. Would I have necessarily chosen these things? No. But I can assure you that God is still on the throne and God is still at work. We got to get our eyes off the things, off the circumstances, off the perspectives. We got to change our perspective and get our eyes on the Lord. Because no matter what happens, no matter what comes, his love is steadfast. So Joseph gets sold into slavery. But yet God used that as a part of his plan. The next way that God remembered his covenant is when he made his people fruitful and turned the Egyptians against them. I mean, it's just interesting when you think about God's plan. It doesn't always go the way we expect, does it? It doesn't always go the way we planned. Because even with Joseph getting sold into slavery, that was an expression of God's faithful care for his people, and so is what happened in Egypt. So verse 23 Israel came to Egypt. That's actually talking about Jacob here specifically, but then the whole group as well. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people very fruitful. He made them stronger than their foes. And then he heard, turned their hearts, that'd be the Egyptians, he turned the hearts of the Egyptians to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. And Pharaoh put the Israelites in slavery and gave them heavy work to do. Do you think they would have chosen that? Probably not. But yet God was using it for his plan. The next way that God remembered his covenant is when he sent Moses and Aaron and brought the plagues on the land of Egypt. Verse 26 says, God sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen, they performed his signs among them. So that would be the 10 plagues spread out over some months. But he sent Moses and Aaron as he remembered his covenant. The next way he remembered his covenant is when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. In verse 37, it says, Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold. They didn't have silver and gold, but here's what happened. The Egyptians wanted to get rid of them so bad, they were almost throwing their silver and gold at them. Take it. Be gone. We're tired of all these plagues. And they took that and they would later use those, that gold and silver to help build the tabernacle to worship the Lord. God's got a plan. So when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, the next way he remembered his covenant is when he provided for the Israelites in the wilderness. Look down at verse 39. It says that God spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to give light by night. So God led them. Verse 40, they asked and he brought quail. So he fed them. He gave them bread from heaven in abundance. They went out and they gathered up the manna and were able to make it into food. Verse 41, he opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. Estimates put the population of Israel at that point in time anywhere from 1.5 upwards to like five or six million. Think about taking the population of Iowa, whatever we are, four or five million, gathering us all up south of Des Moines, and we're going to walk to Texas. 
You're going to need a lot of water and a lot of food. It'd be crazy. Think about how much water that's got to be that God had to provide. But he provided, even through the tough circumstance. And God provided for them for the whole 40 years in the wilderness when they were wandering around. And then God remembered his covenant when he gave them the lands of the nations. Verse 43, he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. He gave them the lands of the nations. They took possession of the fruit of the people's toil that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. God remembered his holy promise to establish the people in the land in order that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws, living faithfully under God's care and then to be deeply grateful to their faithful God. That was a quote that I found in the ESV study Bible that I really, really liked. So the response from the Israelites to the fact that God loved them and that God remembered their covenant, his covenant, should have been one of grateful, faithful, loving obedience. Ours should be as well. How should I respond to the fact that God loves me? Newsflash, in case you don't know, no matter what the circumstances are going on around you, God loves you. In fact, God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins, to pay the penalty for your sins so that you can know, present tense, right now, what will happen when you die. That there is an eternity in heaven waiting for you if you know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. That no matter what is going on around you, your eternal destiny can be secure. What a wonderful truth that is. I don't have to worry about all the circumstances around me. I navigate through them. I take precautions, do all those things, but I don't have to worry about them because of who God is and my eternal destiny is secure in Jesus Christ. I need to believe in Jesus. Have you believed in Jesus as your personal savior? There's a big difference between believing in Jesus and knowing of Jesus. I know of LeBron James. I do not know LeBron James. I do not have a personal relationship with LeBron James. If he walked by me in the street, he wouldn't even see me because he's a foot and a half taller than me, but he has no reason to notice me on anybody. He doesn't know me. But you know what? I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and he knows me. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? So first response is I will believe in Jesus. The second one is I will give thanks to the Lord. This is in verse one. Not exactly rocket science here today. We're not working math formulas or anything like that. This is pretty simple. We're not trying to put somebody on the moon or somebody on Mars. That involves a lot of complicated math. This is pretty easy on how I should respond. Verse one, oh, give thanks to the Lord. It's pretty simple. Jesus loves me, God loves me, God has provided for me, God's gonna remember me, I will give thanks to the Lord. So the opening section invites the congregation to celebrate what the Lord has done. The foundation of gratitude is remembering the wondrous works that God has done. Do I make a habit to talk to God about what I am thankful for? One of the best cures for a grumbling heart is to stop and give thanks, to stop and count my blessings. Parents, have you ever put food on the table for your children and they grumble and complain about it? Oh, I don't like this. Oh, leftovers again. Ever done that? Generally, the first words out of my mouth in response to that is, well, at least you have food to eat. There are plenty of children in the world that don't have food to eat that don't know where their next meal is coming from. So how do I change my grumbling heart in that instance? I stop and give thanks for the food that God has provided. We get so quick to grumble. We get so quick to complain. Well, at least I do. Maybe you're better than me. You might be. But I need to stop and I need to give thanks and I need to count my blessings. The third thing here as a response to God remembering me, remembering his covenant is I will call upon his name. 
So we'll give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. This is the idea of worship, public worship. Calling on the name of the Lord. How's your attitude this morning? Whether you're at home, online, whether you're here, you know, whatever. How's your attitude in coming to church? Is it a, oh man, gotta go to church again. Or we gotta get up and sit down and, and turn, the, turn the online service on. Sometimes, that, isn't that harder to do? That can be harder to do. You know, sit down and turn the online service on. But where's your attitude? Where's your heart? We should be excited to come to church, whether in person or online. We should be excited to come call out to the Lord together. But life happens, and sometimes it can be difficult. Uh, Jeff Foxworthy, who's a comedian, has a funny, funny bit about going to church. And he's like, by the time I get to church, I need church. Because I've yelled at my wife, I've yelled at my kids. You know, we've been, everything's been crazy all morning. And isn't that the truth? You know, I mean, if, if my family was going to a movie, we wouldn't be yelling at people, we wouldn't be frustrated. Things would kind of happen. Why does it happen with church? Maybe because Satan wants us to be frustrated and annoyed walking in the building. So we don't listen. So we don't be still and know that God is God. So I need to call upon his name. The next thing I need to do is I will make known his deeds. I will make known his deeds. I'm excited to talk about the, the fact that the Hawks crushed Michigan State yesterday. Love talking about that. Bring on Iowa State now, right? You know, Last week I thought Iowa State beat Iowa by five touchdowns. Now the Hawks are back. But I'm excited to talk about that. I'm excited to talk about the St. Louis Cardinals. I love baseball. But here's the thing, am I excited to talk about Jesus? Do I talk about what God's doing in my life? Am I willing to talk to my friends, my coworkers, my family about how God is working in my life? And sadly, that is not the case as often as it should be. I will make known his deeds. The next one comes in verse two. Sing to him, sing praises to him. I will sing praises to him is the next one, next response I need. Here's the thing, you don't need to be the best singer. God does not care what your voice sounds like. God cares about what your heart looks like. So if you're out there making a joyful noise to the Lord and it doesn't sound very good to the rest of us, it sounds good to God and that's what really matters. So don't let, I'm not a great singer, keep you from pouring out your heart and soul to the Lord in song. God is so good and so worthy. Man, that ought to be the outpouring of our hearts. The next one's in verse three. Glory in his holy name. So I will glory in his holy name. Well, what does that mean? That means to honor God's reputation, so make it look good, if you will. It means to make much of his name. It means to give 100% to the Lord. So the idea here is in my praises, let the main subject be the name of God, that holy name by which he chooses to be known. I'm going to make much of the name of the Lord. In the Old Testament times, the Israelites so respected the name of the Lord, they would never speak it. When God came to Moses in the burning bush, he said, I am who I am. That's how it's translated in English. Uh, we would look at it um, in the Hebrew as Yahweh or Jehovah. And God says, that's my name. And the, Egyptian, the Egyptians, the Israelites had such high respect for the name, they wouldn't even say it. They didn't want to break the commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain. So when they were reading scripture and they read it out loud, when they came to that, they would substitute Adonai, which means Lord. And everybody knew what the correct word was, but they held the name in such high regard that they substituted Adonai. When the scribes were copying down scripture and they came to where they had to write the name of God, they would go and they would cleanse themselves before they wrote it. 
That's how highly they viewed the name of the Lord. I need to make much about God's name. I need to glory in his name. Far too often I glory in myself or I glory in my accomplishments or I glory in what my kids are doing. And I get wrapped up in all of that and I don't glory in the Lord. The next one is that I will let my heart rejoice. Also from verse three. So glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Now, wait a minute. The hearts of who? The ones who seek the Lord. Which begs the question then, what am I seeking in my life? The idea of rejoicing is being glad here. But the being glad follows seeking the Lord. Am I seeking the Lord in my life or am I seeking a whole lot of other things? Sometimes my heart can't rejoice because it's following things that don't bring lasting joy. Things like money, things like possessions, things like jobs, things like politics, things like sports teams. If I'm placing my joy in those, I'm gonna be severely disappointed a lot. I need to get my eyes on the Lord. And I need to place my trust in him. I need to be seeking him. The next one from verse four, it says to seek the Lord and his strength. Again, the idea of seeking here, but whose strength am I depending on? My own? My own ability to manipulate things? When I thought about this one here, I thought about Jacob. And not because Jacob was physically strong, he wasn't. His brother Esau got all the physical strength. Jacob was very strong manipulative wise. He could manipulate any situation so that he came out on top. He was good at it. And in the first part of his life, he depended on himself and his ability to deceive others and manipulate situations. Until one night, on his way back home from his Uncle Laban's, he'd been there for a long time, he'd gotten married and had 12 sons and at least one daughter. He's on his way back and he has a physical wrestling match with God. And God physically breaks him. He walked with a limp the rest of his life. But at that point, he finally stopped depending on his own ingenuity and he started depending on the Lord. So I will seek God's strength and not my own. The next one is I will seek God's face. Also in verse four, in the ESV it reads, uh, seek his presence continually. The NIV puts it as seek his face always. What does it mean to seek God's face? It means to seek him for who he is. To just stop and meditate on the fact that he is the God of the universe. That he is holy. That he is righteous. That he is just. That he is love. To just simply meditate on who God is. Far too often we seek God's hand before we seek his face. Our prayer life becomes like a Christmas list of I wants and I needs and all this. And I'm not saying those are are not important. They are. We need to pray for other people. But are we taking time to just stop and seek the Lord and just be still and know that he is God and think about who he is, not just what he can do for us? God's not the genie in the lamp that we rub and he pops out and magically fixes everything. That's not how God works. Your circumstances might not change. But if you put your eyes and focus on the Lord, everything else will change. I will seek God's face. Far too often we seek what he can do for us and we forget to just simply seek him. I need to seek who God is before I seek what he will do. Seek his face before seeking his hand. Then the last one here is that I will remember what God has done. Verses five and six. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, the judgment he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Remember what he's done. There were multiple times in Israel's history when they were instructed to build monuments. One of the times is when they came into the promised land with Joshua, God parted the Red, no, sorry, parted the Jordan River in this case. And God told them, you send the leader of each tribe back into the riverbed while the waters are still parted and you get a big rock out of there. And you bring it up and you build a monument out of those 12 big rocks. 
Why? Number one, so you remember that I parted the Jordan River when you came in, but number two, years later when your kids are walking along and they see that monument and they ask you, what's that for? And you tell them, that's how God was faithful, that's how God provided, he parted the Jordan River. Parents, grandparents, do your kids know how God has worked in your life? Have you told them how God has practically worked in your life? They're desperate to know that God is not just some idea out there, but that God is gonna work in the here and now of their everyday lives. That's why God had them build the monument. So future generations would remember that God works in the here and now. God works in the everyday. God has delivered and provided in the past. God will continue to do the same in the present. He will continue to do so in the future. So when you're tempted to grumble and complain, I challenge you to make a list, not of your grumblings and complainings, but make a list from the scriptures of what God has done. Make a list from your own life of what God has done. Make a list from your own life of how God has provided. So let's stop today and take time to seek God's face be thankful and tell others about him. Let's pray. God, you are so good. We can't even fathom how good you are. And Lord, you are so faithful. We can't fathom how faithful you are. Lord, there are hurts, concerns, needs, worries, fears in this congregation today in a whole wide realm of reasons why. God, they're very real. But Lord, so are you. And so is the fact that you provide and work in our lives. And God, I pray that we would get our eyes off our circumstances today and put them on you. And that may, that may not mean that our circumstances go away, God, but, but help us to have the focus that you are gonna work in and through the circumstances for your honor and for your glory. And may we make much of your name today. Help us to seek your face, Lord. And we thank you and praise you for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.